Oh, okay, thank you again, Melissa, for your introduction, and thank you all for coming here this morning. On the subject of thank yous, I'd also like to thank the curators and the installation team for an absolutely wonderful job putting together the exhibition. It's what I would call an itchy exhibition. It makes me itch a little. The work gets inside me. It's not an easy exhibition. It's the kind I like a lot. I also want to thank especially Melissa for her thorough, welcoming organization of numerous details related to my visit, including two wonderful days of fishing on the tree with the sculptor Jay Kirby. And finally, I want to thank our two sign language interpreters, In and Kyra. When we think about the idea of sharing space together, sharing words, sharing ideas, there would be no together thoughts without them. My talk today is not really so much about my work as an artist as it is about how I think as an artist. It's about how selfhood and interests commingle into what I would call multiple viabilities, all having relevance and none having precedence. I'm going to approach this through a particular kind of perceptual practice with a fly fisherman called reading water. This is what fly fishermen do when they approach a river and feel their way through the circumstances of the river. It's something I've been doing since I was five years old. It's only in recent years I've recognized how much this is about art as any other art that I make. In addition to talking about reading water, I plan to talk about fly time. The poet John Keats, the judge Thurgood Marshall, and the deaf artist James Castle. My starting point is fly fishing. While fly fishing seems to have little to do with art, I am working from a premise that to better understand art, it's important to step back from it. To look at and spend time with other things that are seemingly unrelated, yet relevant by virtue of this very unrelatedness. It's also a way of saying that a friend once said to me, you need to have something in your life other than your art that gives you a sense of place in the world, where it provides an internal sense of meaning, possibility, and the risk of failure. Vladimir Nabokov found his satisfaction in studying butterflies. For John Cage, it was mushrooms. For the painter Todd Nordston, it's duck hunting. The point is to have something that's nothing at all to do with your art, except when in some impossible way it has everything to do with your art. This is River in Western Maine, where I fish for Nan Knock Salmon every year. Reading, whether one is reading a poem or a stream, or reading a painting or a situation, it's an interpretative practice. It involves, more than anything, slowing down, lingering, loitering even, taking pleasure in the fact that it's no need to hurry. In a sense, everything we need, our artists, lies within the immediacy of our individual lives. One of the famous mid-century writers on trout fishing, Ray Bergman, used to talk about how, when fishing a particular stretch of a river, he would pause and smoke a cigarette while he surveyed the water. 
the time he smoked the cigarette being just the right amount of time he needed to assess the river. That's pretty close to seven minutes if you want to know how long it takes to smoke a cigarette. If he missed the strike of the fish and wanted to rush the water, he'd smoke another cigarette. The phrase breathing water originated not with fishermen, but with boatsmen. In the late 19th century, it was used to describe how one might read the currents of a river to negotiate passage through it. Anglers quickly adopted the practice. This is what the angler Roger K. Brown had to say about reading water. A stream is just that for a casual observer. A pretty flow of water with life on the surface and growth on the banks. To a fisherman, it is pools and runs and riffles, hidden rocks, sunken reed beds, gravel bars, log jams, and cut banks. Its temperature and flow and color all have special meaning for him. He looks at the surface and reads the depths, judging where fish should live. All this is stream craft, and it is learned not from books. The stream itself and the fish that live in it are the ideal instructors. It's, it's the Otsabo River in upstate New York where I fish every summer. This particular pool I call the office. I can be found here most mornings in the month of June. Every day it's a little different. You never know for sure what to expect until you are there inside the moment. This is the Otsabo River in Michigan which has very different character. The Arts Able in New York is a temperamental river, defined by its rocks. The Arts Able River in Michigan is slow and meandering, lined with cedar trees and sweepers. The difference reminds us that every river brings its own conditions and surprises. In the process of reading water, you read more than just water. It's also about the air and water temperatures and insect activity taking place. Your attention is subsumed by minute details of what is going on around you. The rises, like the rises you see here, might be varied. There are slurpy rises, there are splashy rises, there are slashing rises. And they all tell us something about what the trout might be feeding on. And you look around, Joe, you spend a lot of time looking. Sometimes you can find the trucks of mayflies in the eddies and stoneflies on the shores, like this one resting on a polypore. When reading water, you are also reading the activity of the food chain and making calculated decisions about what flies you might use. There are thousands of name flights and patterns. The two shown here were both tied by the famous Adirondack tire, Fran Bedard. The one on the left is an Otsable bomber, and the one on the right is called an Otsable wolf. Flights like these are suggestive. They don't look like any particular insect, but rather classes of insects, primarily mayfly dense. It's also in them a practical level of information design. Friend was particular about materials and shading. He favored for its patterns a shade of rusty orange opossum fur that he dyed to match the shading of flights in the art table. The flights here on the left are stone flyments, tied by an amateur tire named Carl Brunig in the 1960s. During the winter, Carl lived in New York where he worked at the Harris Dialects. And every summer, he drove six hours north to the Adirondacks where he kept a small cabin. 
When Carol died in 1987, his cabin in flights passed on to its neighbor. And in the cabin today can be found a photograph of Carl and his dog from 1962. It's a photograph that tells us a lot about Carl. He's wearing waders of rubberized canvas. In his right hand, he's holding a homemade wading stuff made from a tree branch. In his left hand, he has folded over a shoulder uh, inexpensive fiberglass rod. This is not the kit of your parents. It's the kit of someone who is doing things in its own way, and doing them with passion. The flags that he tied for himself were singular, and among the tried and brittle flags that he left behind were several nymphs, disproportionately round and crisscrossed with gold tinsel. They were terrible flags, terrible types. But the enigma about flights is that even terrible flights catch fish. The functionality is not measured by the visual appearance, but how they behave as a hydrodynamic form. In Carl's fly boxes, I found four flights of the Arsable wolf that had been tied by Fran who lived a mile up the road from Carl. You can tell that friend tied them because of the orange thread around the head. They look ready and faded from year to youth, and three of them had the hook points broken off. They are no longer useful to catch fish, yet decidedly too precious as historical patterns to throw away. Every fly box is a kind of anthropological archive. Its importance is in its record of an individual's relationship with water and the fish. You can spend a lot of time learning about fishing, reading water, by reading books like this one or at least fishing dry flies for a trout. I took this picture out of fishing camp I share with three anglers in Maine. The book belongs to a guy named Joel. Joel is an amazing caster. He can put a fly in a teacup 40 feet away. Cats flicking in right in the teacup. I've never met anyone quite like him. He's probably read this book several hundred times. Look at how dark-eared it is. I tried to buy it from him, actually, but he wouldn't sell it to me. He sent me a new copy with something about its relationship with this particular copy that was totally unique. Now, Joel is the kind of guy who will get up at 3 in the morning Drive 15 miles down a really bad dirt road in an old car with bad shocks so he could be at the river at 5 in the morning before dawn. He'll walk two miles to get there as well. Just to fish a 30-foot section of the river. That section of the river he will have studied for days. He will have walked in it or crossed it. He will turn rocks in the river. He will get to know that river better than he knows the back of its own hand. What does it mean to study water as one step beyond reading water? In one of his letters to his friend, the poet John Keats described that like this, he said, If a sparrow comes before my window, I take part in its existence and pick about the gravel. And then he goes on to note that a poet has no identity. He is continually in for and informing some other body. Stop and think about that phrase for a minute. A poet has no identity. What does our identity come from? It's a compelling image for me, abandoning the tone sense itself to take part in the existence of its subject. 
I'm often asked, for example, what goes into making a good artist, or a good curator, or a good fisherman? And my reply is always the same, curiosity. It's one of the most important ways of extending your mind that I can think of. Keats is one of my touchstones. By touchstone, I mean someone whose art I know probably better than I owe my own. I think it's important for artists to get outside of ourselves and into the lives of others. One of my other touchstones is Thurgood Marshall. Not many people know Marshall's work very well. He was the lead lawyer in the Supreme Court case of Brown v. Board of Education, which led to the desegregation of schools in America. He later became a Supreme Court justice himself. We often talk about art as a form of activism, but also important is to imagine activism as a form of art where it gets exhibited, not in the gallery, but in the courtroom. One of my less well-known projects is a lawsuit titled United States of America versus GPH Management, otherwise known as the Gramercy Park Hotel. I don't often talk about this project, but it somehow seems relevant today, so I will. It began in May 1996 when I did a project with the gallery called AT Project Room. It's part of the Gramercy Park Art Fair. At one point, I needed to make a phone call, so I went down to the reception desk to ask for a tele device for the deaf. It's a communication device for deaf people to communicate over telephone lines. Remember, in 1996, this was before we had cell phones for messaging the way we use them today. Now, the hotel was supposed to have one, but they didn't. When I asked the manager why he didn't have one, he wrote and replied that nobody ever asked before, which I said, plausible reply, okay. But I kept the note when he wrote on it. Eight years later, I was back at the hotel. I had to make a call, so I asked the manager on duty, could I use the TVD? And the manager, a different manager, this time said, um, we don't have one. Why not? And she said, well, nobody ever asked before. So I had two managers, two different times saying nobody asked before in writing. <clears throat> so I sent that off to Department of Justice and wrote up a formal complaint. The DOJ went into the hotel and found numerous violations of Americans with Disabilities Act. Over 50, to be exact. The hotel said, whoa, 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 wait, wait, we're an old hotel. We can renovate the hotel. We will hire the very best um, architectural designers for accommodations in the country. We'll make it perfect. Department of Justice said, okay, when you're done, we'll come back. Two years later, they were done with the renovations, DOJ went back, they found even more violations than there were originally, which led to the settlement and consent decree. Now the thing is, this kind of art is in some ways the hardest to make. Opposing lawyers try to shred you of your dignity. They try to trip you up at every turn. Even when they know they are wrong, they will try to destroy you. They go into your health records. They go into your tax records, looking for dirt on you. It's probably the most thankless stuff you'll ever do. But when it comes to your own dignity, doing the stuff that you believe in, it's probably the most important work you'll ever do. It's law like art. I think so. The one thing that they both have in common is that we're trying to undo and redo historical conventions. 
in police and get people to see the world differently. Another way of putting it is to say that beauty is difficult. The idea came into my head more than 20 years ago when I was visiting a friend in New York. A large part of our conversation had to do with the senses and how communication involved a wide array of possibilities outside the norm of what it means to be human. Deep into the conversation, my friend told me a story about a friend's baby who was blind. The baby, she explained, had learned to imitate perfectly the sound of a refrigerator and the sound of a car going over the gravel as it approached the house. After a long pause, which we considered the implications of this, my friend turned to me and said, Beauty is difficult. Never forget that. I'm going to shift my talk now to the work of the artist James Castle. It's a shift from one form of slowness to another form of slowness. Castle is what some might call an outsider artist, but I don't like that word outsider much, so I'm not going to use it. Castle was born deaf in rural Idaho in 1899. He was sent to a school for a deaf for a while, but apparently never learned English or sign language with any degree of proficiency. So he was sent home, where for 62 years he made a turret nurse supply out of materials that surrounded him. In came from soot mixed with spit. Paper came from whatever paper he could find in the house. Boxes turned inside out, telephone books and so on. Castle came into my life quite accidentally. It was a doorknob that first caught my attention. Two of them actually. One doorknob facing the right, one door not facing the left, with the edge of the door in the middle. This was in the year 2000. It was the first time I saw a castle drawings and I decided to leave my show in New York. I wasn't looking for the show, I just sort of stumbled over it while making my usual gallery mount. And then there were those doorknobs. The angle of the perspective was a neutral one. Not one knob or the other knob, but both sideways in between the edge of the frame and the door. What is it that makes the edge of a door and two door not so compelling, despite also being so banal? Hence, it's not a world of small things made big. The word masterpiece felt awkward in Castle's critical lexicon. Instead, it's, it's a world of objects, people, and places that penetrate our consciousness through their understatement. He presents us with fragile moments of human existence, a narrative compendium of daily life. Inside, there were stoves and ceilings and floors, door knobs and door jams, screen doors and bedroom doors, blue doors and tan doors, while some wallpaper. And outside there were landscapes and farmscapes and barns and buildings and outbuildings and outhouses and buggies and wheelbarrows and silos and birds of all kinds, ducks and geese and turkeys and roosters. We can add to the it's word and phrase drawings derived from and drawn in newspapers and matchboxes and toilet paper packaging. Compare all of this with the artist Paul Gauguin. Gauguin went halfway around the world to Tahiti to find its subject. Castle found it right at home.
I realize I haven't really talked about my work yet. It's about see the work I have in the exhibition, so now it's a good time to bring it in. My castle, my conversations derive from my everyday life, a certain kind of ordinariness that the nor art historian Norman Bryson calls ropography. Ropography is derived from the Greek word Ropos, R-H-O-P-O-S, meaning trivial or petty objects. The sort of mundane things that, in composing the starlight painting, compose our lives as human beings. My deafness is pretty extreme. I became totally deaf 52 years ago. And right now I am deaf as a doorpost, literally, except I don't really know what a doorpost is. I keep seeing that in the outside of people. What's a doorpost? I mean, language is such bloody chaos when you're deaf. Lip reading, it's difficult. A lot of words look alike on the lips. When you say the word vacuum, it looks like you're saying, fuck you. I mean, uh, it's so easy to get things so wrong. So for decades, I've been asking people to write down what they're saying. That's a practical way of communicating. At one point, I started saving the paper. So one day, I spread them on the floor of my studio and tried to... Learn from them. I could not have invented these papers if I wanted to. This was in the early 1990s, and we were coming out of the first Gulf War. And the stock market crash of 1987 pretty much had put an end of the megalomania of the 1980s. Most of the artists I knew at the time were working with very modest materials on a modest scale. Like Tony Fairs, and Curtain Sculptures, Felix Gonzalez, Tariq, Candy Pizzas, and the conversations, mere scraps of paper, somehow fit into the scheme of things. And a bit of a detour now. We normally think of conversation as something linear, like maybe in a Tolstoy novel. When we stop and think about it, that's not how we communicate. We cross words on top of each other words. We get fragments, bits and pieces. We're missing context. For words, phrases, syllables get dropped. This was a birthday party conversation on the tablecloth. Three different speakers, words and words. When I first started working with the conversations, I realized that they really weren't writing. It's more a form of talking on paper something that occupies the space between speech and writing, without being one or the other. When I first started showing the work, I had a small narrative context for the piece in the form of a framed storyline that was mounted beside the conversation. I'm going to read one to you now. This is from a conversation that was in one of my first shows in New York, 1994. One night when I was in New York, it was close to midnight, and I was heading back to my car in Soho, when the man gestured to me. I couldn't understand what he was saying, so I asked him to write. The man seemed a little surprised at my request, but he took it seriously and started to write. The letters came slowly. He wrote, M, O, N, and then he stopped. 
He seemed confused, as if he wasn't sure what came next. But the long pause, and then he crossed out the unfinished word and tried to start again. He wrote the letter M, but stopped and didn't continue. He paused again, and then he crossed out the M. He then moved over to a railing and leaned on it and tried the third time. He wrote another M. By now I sensed anxiety on his part. He stole paying glances at passers by, perhaps hoping that someone would help him in this effort to communicate. He looked back down at the letter M he had made and tried to erase it, but my pencil didn't have an eraser. So he did with this M what he did with the previous M and crossed it out. At this point, he could have given up. People were walking by, time was being lost, and this word that begins with an M was not right itself. He tried again, with his fourth effort now, to give words to a gesture. But this time he tried a new direction, one that shifted from object to subject. He wrote down I. Then there was a pause. Then he wrote down M, Y, my. And then there was another pause. Then finally, he crossed it all out. This was the end, and in a sense, it said more than mere words could have said. Had he been able to write the word money, a social transaction would have been perfunctory. But in its failure to inscribe its desire, everything about its life became painfully drawn out. Of the tens of thousands of written conversations I've had with people over the past 30 years, this particular one has the fewest words, yet says by far the most. In the late 1990s, I stopped using the story line to focus on developing in each work two narratives. One is a verbal narrative based on how the words lead from one paper to the next paper, and a formal narrative that's based on the grid. A work like this takes me three or four months or two, and I generally make only one per year. The colored papers, in particular, are very hard to work with because the placements are decided by so many factors. The shape and size of the paper, the color of the paper, the actual words, the way the words are inscribed. As Joseph Albert said about color or relations, you cannot put one color beside another color without also changing both. This is also true for verbal narratives. You cannot put one word beside another without also changing both. For a wall work that has 100 papers in it, it will take me about 10,000 papers in the archive to make it. It's a very slow process. So I'm coming back to a theme here and now. Slowness. What distinguishes the slow life from the slow life it's how the slow life involves continuous peregrinations of moving through physical space, inside and outside, front side and back side, on top and underneath. Kettle found its place within his perceptions of his surroundings. He looked with equal care at the overlooked and the interlocked. A few days ago, I was in a restaurant down the street reading Roger Deacon's book, Notes Up on a Tree Farm. And at one point, Deacon said, Looking, just looking, is all we have to do to see the essential truth. This is all Turner did. Likewise, it's all Castle did. What mattered most was the way Castle remade its surroundings into something other than they were. It looks easy. It isn't. The irony of work like this is that adds the effect of taking us to a place we've never been before. 
a place that surrounds us all of the time. The kind of intelligence that goes into making art like this, it's not a rational intelligence. It's not a logical intelligence. It's not even what some might call a creative intelligence. This is because art occupies the space of human activity that involves rearranging the physical universe. It's part of the process of making the unmade. This is why the addiction of rational humanistic thought fails us in the case of someone like Hatzel, whose life and art largely occupy a realm of the ineffable. And one of its letters keeps described the uniqueness of ineffable thinking as negative capability. Several things dovetailed in my mind, and at once it struck me what quality went to form a man of achievement, especially in literature, in which Shakespeare possessed so enormously. I mean, negative capability. That is, when man is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. Coolidge, for example, would let go by a fine, isolated, very similar to, cut from a penetralium of mystery, from being incapable of remaining content with half knowledge. This pursuit through volumes would perhaps take us no further than this, but with the great poet, the sense of beauty overwhelms every other consideration or obliterates our considerations. In so many ways, Castle was a quintessential negative capability, feeling its way through the mysteries of its surroundings and its materials. He could not read English, but he could read daily life. When we are perceiving our place in the universe, either as fishermen or as artists, that's all that matters. Thank you. Very happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Joseph. It was such a wonderful exploration of your, your work, your inspirations. Uh, and I was thinking about this um, analogy of stream craft, and you were saying, um, in the quotation, you were talking about the uh, ideal, not being able to learn from books, but better to learn from the fish in the stream itself. How would you relate this to art directly and say art craft? How would you relate this to art? directly and it's a art craft. Well, there are a lot of different ways of doing this. Let's take the academic side of things here. I've never, this isn't known, I don't think I've ever admitted this publicly before. I've never taken in courts in earth in my life. I've never taken a course in studio art or art history, ever. I've never been in no classroom as a student. My art education came from being in studios, in galleries, seeing as many exhibitions as possible. It came from asking galleries to do things like take the painting off the wall, please don't want to look at the backside of it. So basically, it's a way of just not basing inquiry on preconceptions about what art is, but rather just getting lost in it. I feel like getting lost in your subject matter is a great way to go, like Walter Benjamin said, about experiencing a new city for the first time. You don't want to have a map to follow the map. You want to have no map and get lost in the city. Similar way. Right? Get lost in the subject. A lot of great things to be said for getting lost. Just looking at the the photographs that you had up there of some of the 
the collections of notes. And I was just wondering about how they sort of function over time and like how, how much those <coughs> personal encounters maybe matter or the like the individuals who have like um, written on this piece of paper like I was looking at the one that said cow pig lamb and I thought that was quite hilarious and and uh, just wondering about like, what all those do like over time for yourself um, normally I can remember the particular incident the person the time that we had these exchanges but I also have to depersonalize myself from the work and able to work with it effectively. One of the hardest things to do as an artist is let go of your own emotions. Now, there's some work papers I can't put into some pieces. Sometimes when names are used in a way that says something about someone else, that's where the personal becomes a reflection on someone else rather than myself. But in many ways, in the space between having the conversation and making the artwork, the entire personal narrative gets cut out and removed. And the papers are just like paint you squeeze out of the tube, abstract materials to work with. And I need that kind of objectivity to really develop a piece that gets too personal. That could be interesting to other people. And really, the conversations are not so much about me, it's really other people, because my voice is absent. I'm talking, other people are writing, and people often say, oh, quickly stuff's about Wrigley, but it's really not, it's about all of you, really. This is the interesting thing about the whole process, and it's a reflection on the strategy to other people develop to engage in this process, for me, it's ordinary, every day. I will often say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm deaf, would you write that down? I just have this habit of apologizing. I don't know why, because I'm inconveniencing people. It's like, I'm sorry, but I'm dead. No, for me, that's ordinary, putting it in the door. <clears throat> but for the other person, the beat stable acts, the usual rhetorical flourishes of speech serve them no purpose, so to start writing and adapt to that, and it's amazing to see what comes out of that, including how big laugh. That's a variation of what we call turducken. I don't know if you have turducken. Can I write on this? So. <laughs> Two ducking, yeah. Anyone know what that is? Uh, another one. It's funny if it's American things that some people do at Thanksgiving. You have a turkey, then you put a duck inside the turkey, then you put a chicken inside the duck. Small chicken and yet a hen. There you So, co pig lamb, not idea. Okay? <laughs> Little bit of history, that's not in the piece, but almost every one of those conversations has some kind of story, history to go with it. That's why, as I said early on, I had the story meant. But then shifting to the larger pizzas like we have here, I wanted to bring more of a visual narrative into the pizzas. Since the grid historically removed language, think of Tarlouette, like it's Martin and so on. Try to get away from language. I want to put language back in the grid.
Okay, good question. Yet to know. There was a time in history when a pencil was the Apache of technology. The way we consider the cell phone and the Apache of technology today, especially with speech recognition. For example, when I meet with a couple of people, we'll use a phone or an iPad for speech recognition and go that way in our conversation. I like the pencil and paper because of the immediacy of it. It's unmediated. There's no errors in it, and it sends that transcription out. Now, wait a minute. Plus, there's the inflection of personality in the hand. And we stop and think about different technologies that emerged over the years from like fax machines to email to texting. They all have a particular place and I don't consider that any obliviates previous technologies. I still love that. I love sending people. I don't send that, send them things. So, they've got character on it. People have to hold things in their hands, too. And look at the exhibition. How many hands are there? It could retitle an exhibition of hands as a subtitle. And that's a big part about how we evolve. Plus, when you're dealing with the pencil and paper, you are making lines, seeing where a line can go. And... You're not doing that with the phone the same way with speech recognition. So I think that the paper lets the mind go places where the phone sets up a template that we have to fit inside of. Okay. They all have their place, but some are just more fun than others. So and I find that writing, for example, for a lot of people sitting around the table and suppose there might be an interpreter there. And people see the interpreter on the party and think, how do I fit in with that? Because sometimes they see the language as being a little alienating, like what's the protocol for engaging in the conversation with that person, the interpreter? But if people are writing, they say, oh, I can do that too. And so they'll write something, and then when I find the moment, give me the note, now how about start the conversation? And then what's funny is that uh, other people would start writing to each other. There's a great deaf joke that goes like this. There's a deaf guy and a hearing guy in the bar together. And they're writing back and forth. And another hearing guy comes in. So the three of them are writing back and forth with each other. And finally, that guy says, It's late, I have to go. Okay, bye. So he goes back and he's at the door and he looks back and the two Hearing guys should start riding back and forth with each other. I don't need to. Okay. Thank you so much, Joseph. It's been a very generous talk. Um, my question is quite a practical one. I'm wondering if you can talk through your process in terms of collecting conversations as a material. So do you do any editing when you're deciding what to keep? Um, and also how do you work with that material? Do you store it in some way or have an archive you build? I'm just curious about your, your kind of process through this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, first question. When it comes to editing, no, I don't alter the papers at all. There's only been one instance where I did have to remove a name from one that was printed. Now, normally when I'm dealing with the paper, I will ask people, can I keep these? Sometimes now I will leave them, give them to people that vary. But I self-edit in terms of what I show or not. There's one piece, for example, I've made 
that it's almost entirely gossip. I haven't shown it, and nobody is going to show it until I am dead, because if I try to show it, people are going to want to kill me. Someone's going to have to wait. So, I tend to be pretty careful with this kind of situation. And it's important with people who've written for 25 or 30 years telling me personal stuff, developing a level of trust. Very, very important part of it. It's sort of scary. But when I print them, there's a whole different set of legal obligations connected with that process. You have to be especially careful. Almost always get permission from the people who write them when I print them. The other part of your question, yes, I use archival boxes and folders to organize the archive. There are different ways I organize it. There are, there's an archive of particular people. There's an archive of drawings. There are separate archives of papers of particular colors. Two other huge archives for pieces, one called white noise, the other called black noise. It's an oval shaped room, about 30 feet long, 22 feet wide, filled floor to ceiling with conversations in one case, all white papers, and the other all colored papers. I've only shown white noise before, not black noise, three times, and about 3,000, 3,500 papers in it. Normally they're made with the template, like the one we have here, since I'm laying out the work on my studio floor. And everything becomes so deliberate, I end up cutting out holes. It's a linen back with paper. And so the template travels with the work. We put the template up, slip the papers in with a low tack tape, then we move the template, adjust the paper, it's then pin them up, then we move the tape. Okay. But with white noise, it's all freehand. It takes about eight or nine days for people to install. Okay. But the archive storage systems, okay, it's like the papers all have acid in them. It's ordinary papers. The stuff's going to fall apart over time. I feel acidified some. Some collectors find a put plexi over it. Sometimes it's fine to pin the paper off on the wall. That's life. All our works are going off, fall apart over time. Shelley wrote about that, and I see man, that's the sonnet of his. Nothing's permanent. Any other questions? Oh, okay, sorry. Hi. Um, I just wondered, you talked about um, the slow life and you talked about the repography oh, in your own work. And, and I, think, um, I think also you talked about still life. D does your work relate to, do you think of it as still lives and, and how, and the slow life and still life, how, how do the, what, what are the differences? <laughs> okay, uh, I'll think about. Think about the word I used before, Norman Brightson's idea of ropography. It's in the book he wrote called Looking at the Overlooked, you know that book, okay? The thing is, when we think of ordinariness, I tend to think the most ordinary thing that defines our lives is ordinary conversation. A lot of artists who are using language are trying to hit on some big, grand, profound Shakespearean-like utterance. I'm trying to find some of the most, I don't know, let me rephrase that. 
the meaning for in the meaning that's and it's still like that there are two ah, the meaning for and the meaning that I haven't fully analyzed the idea of the soul life in a large scale but for me the soul life comes from just this puttering around soulness without subject matter it's a really great book called Literature. So, I'll show you something. I'll show you. Mark Chambers has a book called Literature, or oh, I love that title. The idea of loitering. And I just, so, um, I don't have a grand scheme of them yet. It's not something I've written about extensively. But a lot could be said for that, looking at someone like Castle, for example. But before I go on next thing, do you have ideas about it? <laughs> do you have... Do you have ideas about the slow life and still life um, since you've thought about it? Um, oh, I, I think about it in my own, in my own work. Okay. Yeah, and I, and I guess I think about, um, yeah, your, your, your language and your collection and your archives. Okay. Um, hi, I, I am now. Okay, I'm now uh, working, inspiring from the haptic poetry, and uh, I want to create something for blind people, uh, blind children especially. So, um, one of my questions uh, is not quite directly linked to that. My question is that: Do you actually believe in communication, or communication um, is just a, um, a, a numerous? A method the human being has been trying to communicate and the, the method is just uh, on top of the communication itself and we actually it's, uh, uh, we are all isolated oh. from the very beginning to the end so yeah that's it thank you could you repeat the last bit please uh, and we are we are actually uh, isolated from oh. the very beginning to the end we, we do not actually communicate with, with each other No, we don't. <laughs> well, let's stop and think about the conjunctions we're using. Do we communicate with people? Do we communicate to people? And so on. A big difference. Now, when you talk about doing something, who said for blind people? Right away, my warning bell went off. Are you doing it for them? Are you doing it with them? Big difference. It's one thing that I find a little bit disconcerting with some projects I've been engaged with when people have said, well, we're doing this for deaf people. I'm thinking, want to do it with them or don't do it at all. People would say, oh, your interpreter is here. The interpreter for you. And I'm the interpreter, it's not for me alone. The interpreter is for all of us. This is very, very important when you engage disability in your work. Trying to create a platform where you're really sharing the work the direction, the possibility, to the outcome, and the acknowledgement of it. So it's something to keep in mind. Now, the larger thing about communication is partly predicated on that dilemma. Really, the next thing about communication is how imperfect it is. Especially when you compare like, speech versus writing. Gadamer 
Han Schultz got him on a great interview with Han Torrey Garbett. talked about how and Gadamer was about 100 years old when he did this interview. He said that writing just can't reflect the range of emotions of human speech, which is really true in many ways. Pause it, and then what's funny about this interview? Gadamer fell asleep. And Albert said, um, um, I thought, okay, but he was her hands up. So, then for um, 15 minutes, I didn't know what to do. So I wake him up or what? Then finally the phone ran. And then dad would woke up. Oh, oh, where were we? <laughs> oh, yes, we were talking about talent, right? How long would I sleep in for? About 15 minutes. God, what the, how would you transcribe that? That guy was brilliant. How do you describe 15 minutes of silence in an interview? So, yeah, there's a lot to be discovered about communication. Haptic, auditory, visual, olfactory. It's really wide open possibility. That's the beauty of it. So I encourage you to do that work, but just keep in mind, do with people.